All right, how's everyone doing tonight? Welcome to our last and final webinar of our winter series, The Science of Saving Right Whales, uh, with special guest Amy Warren from the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life at the New England Aquarium. Um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We'll get things rolling. Uh, again, my name is Brian and I'm joined with Ashley Stokes uh, from our Marine Mammal Rescue Team here at the Science Center. And I wanna introduce our special guest, Amy Warren uh, with Anderson Cabot Center. Uh, you, Amy, you wanna, you wanna tell them what you do over there and uh, give a little, little intro? Yeah, hey everyone, happy to be here. Um, I'm a research assistant at the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life, the New England Aquarium. And I'm part of a very longstanding team of scientists that study the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale. Nice. And Amy, uh, you know, this is such an interesting topic. It relates very closely to the work that we do at the Seacoast Science Center's Marine Mammal Rescue Team, because if one of these animals was to, to, to come ashore, you know, our team would be the ones to, to go. We'd be part of that response. Um, and, and Amy, you are also a uh, volunteer for our marine mammal rescue team as well. So you're you're wearing multiple hats here tonight at this webinar, which is pretty cool. Um, and and Amy, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your background. How did you get into this position where you're at, where you're researching the North Atlantic right whale? Yeah, I mean, I can't say exactly where it started. I just remember as a kid, just having this affinity for dolphins and whales and the ocean and really anything that lived in the ocean you know, cue the obsession. I had dolphins covering my walls, you know, all the things I owned had whales on them. Free Willy was one of my favorite movies. You know, the list goes on. Um, and as I started getting older and getting close to college, I realized that I could actually make a career out of it if I wanted to. So I actually grew up in Portsmouth, um, not far from home. Um, and so I spent a lot of time near the ocean. Um, definitely went to the Seco Science Center as a kid in school. Um, but so I ended up go, studying marine biology at University of New Hampshire and got a degree, a bachelor's degree there. And then after college, as most people do, I said, I don't know what to do with this. I knew I wanted to study whales and look at the ocean, but that was pretty big. I ended up working on a whale watching boat, started as an intern, came back as a deckhand and uh, worked in the galley and so they worked my way up to being one of the naturalists um, where I was the kind of I was the tour guide if you will on the boat teaching folks about whales and along that lines I ended up um, doing some seasonal work doing aerial surveys in the southeast U.S. so I worked in South Carolina, Georgia and Florida flying in a very small airplane looking for right whales and their newly born calves. Um, and so that job and the whale watching job are both seasonal. So I spent about eight or nine years bouncing back and forth from the New Hampshire area to the Southeast. So I was a little bit of a snowbird, but I do really like snow. I just followed the whales. Nice. And I mean, your like your career path is just so interesting because so you essentially like in short, you flew in planes documenting these animals. Right. And I actually do have a picture here of you uh, working on one of these vessels. Um, so I don't know if you could talk a little bit about like just just what it's like to be out there, um, you know, doing this work and witnessing these animals, which which there are so few left, like so few people really get the chance to to even see these alive in the wild. You know, like what what is that like? It's it's really incredible. And I mean, just seeing whales in general, like no matter the species, it's always been really special to me. And to have the two different perspectives of seeing them from a boat and seeing them from the air are both really special. Like the amount of people that have asked me, like, what's better? I, I can't answer uh, because they both bring really, really interest, cool experiences to it. Um, but like something about being on a boat next to the whale, you can hear it breathing. You can smell its often terrible breath. It's just so, it's so cool to, I don't know, get to spend time with these huge animals. Mind you, like right whales are 50 feet long and 50 tons, sometimes even bigger than that. They're just enormous creatures, yeah. but they're somehow so graceful and it's just incredible. And then just to add on to the fact that there's not many left, the current population is estimated to be 336 individual yeah. North Atlantic right whales. And so, 
I mean, I get to see a lot in my career, which I'm so grateful for, but the average person might be lucky if they see one in their lifetime. Yeah. I mean, Ashley, you've been working with marine mammals for a, for a very long time now. And have, have you ever seen one in the field? I've never seen them live in the field. Um, I've only seen, unfortunately, a deceased entangled animal that I was assisting uh, with the necropsy. Yeah. And, and I never did either. I spent some time working on fishing vessels and, and I, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's truly a unique experience. Um, so hopefully one, one day I'd, I'd love to see uh, a live one. Amy, you got to take us out one day. I, I don't know if that's possible. But, um, <laughs> I'll see what I can do. Yeah. But, uh, but moving forward here in the conversation. So you mentioned that there's three, 336 individuals left, correct? That's, that's that number you said. Um, I, w I was hoping we could talk a little bit about the history of North Atlantic right whales and kind of what, what got them to this predicament that they're in today. Um, you know, why are they so endangered? They're, they're one of the most endangered large whale species in the entire world. Um, I don't know if, if Ashley even as well, if you want to touch on this a little bit. Yeah, so the, the backstory actually comes from the name a bit. They're called the North Atlantic right whale is because they were the right whale to hunt. They yeah. were the, the most accessible and the easiest in the very early days of whaling. They tend to move very slowly and they are very fat or buoyant. And so they actually floated once they were killed. And so back when they just had men in canoes, the whales were slow enough that they could row up to a whale, kill it, and then it process it right there on the surface. So they didn't need these big, powerful ships. And to add to that is that right whales are notoriously found just off the coastline of the eastern United States and eastern Canada. Um, they call, they're actually nicknamed the urban whale because they spend most of their lives very close to shore. So these whalers yeah. didn't have to go hundreds of miles off, offshore to find them. So it was very easy. And so their population got decimated really early on. In fact, it was more early. It wasn't until much later when the technology got better that other whales like faster fin whales or minke whales started getting targeted um, because the rowboats couldn't catch up to those. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so ultimately the, you know, the commercial whaling back in the day, it put a real, real dent in this population that, that they haven't been able to come back from essentially. Um, and, and today they face modern threats, but uh, Ashley, could you, could you touch on the Marine Mammal Protection Act a little bit here? Because I think that sets a timeline after this initial stage of exploitation of these animals um, you know, they, they were protected and, and measures were beginning to take place uh, to, to recognize that depletion and, and hopefully save the species, right? Sure. Um, so the Marine Mammal Protection Act itself was uh, passed in October of 1972. And basically what that says is if you're a marine mammal, you're protected federally. Uh, meaning that it's essentially illegal for anybody to hunt, harass, kill, even if that harassment is minimal, such as, you know, trying to get up next to an animal, whatever it may be on the beach, and taking that that selfie or trying to get that perfect photo, you know, of the animal looking, looking at you or moving down the beach. Um, so any form of harassment or it, even incidental takes of those animals do have to be reported. Um, so, marine, you know, the Marine Mammal Protection Act has done great things for a lot of marine mammals. Um, unfortunately, for right whales, they're they're not in great shape, even still with those, you know, with different protections put into place. But when something is federally protected, there's just more eyes on it. Um, so from, you know, from a federal standpoint, they're looking more closely. So tonight, of course, we're talking specifically about right whales and what's going on with them, what threats they face, um, and what their future might look like. So you'll hear us talk a little bit about report cards, you know, just like when you were in school, you know, we're looking at how these animals are doing over time, um, year to year. And if anything happens, such as an unusual mortality event, um, you've heard us often talk about seals, if you follow our Marine Mammal Rescue Program, um, we just, in 2018, had an unusual mortality event with seals, um, but that was thousands of animals. So, you know, to the, the people that don't study this work on a daily basis or follow this work on a daily basis, you don't need to know a whole lot to know that that's a big number. Um, but when you hear us talk about right whales, 
the situation is very different. You know, when you're talking about less than 400 animals in a population, even one death is pretty significant. Um, and when this, we have an open, unusual mortality event for right whales now um, that began in 2017, and that year there were 17 deaths. Um, so again, for a population that's less than 400, 17 is a very significant hit. Um, yeah. So that unusual mortality event continues to stay open, um, meaning that there's more federal resources going towards it um, and towards looking at what mitigation measures we can take to help these animals try to rebound. Yeah. And so, Amy, you touched on the habitat here. And I do have a map that you shared with us uh, of right North Atlantic right whale habitat. I was hoping you could talk a little bit about this specifically. Where do they move year to year uh, or, or throughout the year? And what kind of habitats are they really focusing on on the east coast of the U.S.? Yeah, so um, in general, um, like I mentioned, they're um, found right near the coastline in the eastern U.S. and eastern Canada. And the cool thing is, you know, we have uh, some people may know about other whales that migrate down to the Caribbean. Right whales stay pretty local. Their range is basically from Florida to Newfoundland. And as I mentioned, close to the coastline. And so just to be clear, not all of the whales are going to follow this migration. Um, it just depends on what they're, what they are, what they're doing that year, how they're feeling, things like that. But generally speaking, um, in the winter months, the whales will travel down to the, off the coast of Georgia and Florida. And that's the, that's their calving grounds in the winter. They go down there to give birth to their young in the nice, warm, clear waters because even though right whales have a lot of fat, they're not born with that fat. So if they were born here in the Northeast in the winter, it'd be really tough for the young ones to survive. Um, so pregnant females will go down there. Sometimes younger whales will go down there just because that's where they're, they were born and they kind of just feel out where they're going. Um, but typically in the summer months, um, really, really spring, summer and fall months, uh, the right whales are um, in different areas in the Northeast. Um, so especially spring, like actually right now, this time of year, there's a quite a few right whales in Cape Cod Bay and it's one of their main feeding grounds. Um, and it, in terms of the Gulf of Maine, it's their most popular feeding ground. Sometimes you'll see whales off the coast of New Hampshire, Maine, and up into the Bay of Fundy. Um, but especially this time of year, actually one of the recent surveys had a hundred whales in one survey, which if you're keeping wow. track, that's more than a third, that's about a third of the population. Yeah. Um, in one survey. Um, and then they'll move up to the Gulf of St. Lawrence later in the summertime um, and do more feeding there. And then the migration kind of goes back the other way, back down to um, off the coast of New England. And then, um, of course, down the mid-Atlantic, all those lots of shipping that goes into those mid-Atlantic states, especially like DC area, Delaware, New York, those are lots of big shipping ports. And that's just one of one of the many risks that the whale space is going back and forth across all of that shipping. Yeah, definitely. And we'll talk more about the modern threats that these animals face a little bit later in the in the webinar. Um, but next, I kind of want to dive into the catalog that you all have at Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life. This is one of the longest running research studies on whales, uh, like ever? It, am I, am I correct in saying that? Uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's the longest, but it's one of the longest standing large whale research teams. Yeah. And, and so, uh, Amy, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the catalog itself and how, how do you, by going out and, and doing, participating in these surveys, these at sea and aerial surveys, how do you come to that population estimate of 336 individuals. You know, how, how does that happen with that catalog? So to start, the really cool thing about North Atlantic right whales is that we can actually tell them apart individually. Um, so what, from one whale to another, they have what we call callosity patterns on the top of their head. And so these callosity patterns are basically rough patches of skin where these whale lice or cyamids tend to gather. So the skin is black or very dark, but the cyamids are actually bright white. So if you see in those lower pictures, all that white around the head, those are what we call the callosity patterns. And you can see just from those two photos below that they they can vary quite a bit. And especially as someone who studies this, you can really see very minor differences because we get lots and lots of photos. And so we can really zoom in, look really closely. Uh, but so the fact that each of each and 
each one of these whales looks different means that we can look at all these sightings that we get, these photos that we take and see who each whale is. And so these whales are put into a catalog, the North Atlantic right whale catalog. And we actually have give them, they all get identification numbers. Um, and some of them we even get, we give them names. Um, these names are usually based off of markings that we see on them. Um, if anyone's familiar with humpback whales getting names, it's a little similar, a little different. We're not looking at the tails so much. We're looking more at the heads. Um, so this is an example, that's an example of a whale named boomerang uh, for the shape on the underside of her tail that resembles a boomerang. Uh, so just one of the many examples. Um, this is actually, so these screen grabs here are actually from the online catalog. So anyone actually is welcome to go check out the North Atlantic right whale catalog. You can flip through and flip through every single one of the whales. Um, there's currently 773 whales in the catalog, but that's all whales that have ever been cataloged. That's not just the ones that are alive. So we only, we think there's about 336 alive, um, but we don't remove whales from the catalog after they've passed. Um, so because we're able to individually identify them, we can keep track of them better and get a better sense of exactly how many there are. So we're not double counting whales. And my team does go out and do our own research on boats. And then our we have colleagues that do surveys in planes and looking at these whales. But we're actually also getting sightings from all kinds of organizations across up and down the East Coast, even from Canada, um, and even from the public. If people see right whales from the beach or from their boat, all of those sightings are eventually coming to us for us to sort through all these photos identify which whale it is, and then put it into the catalog. And so collecting all these sightings allows us to really see how many whales there actually are, rather than just estimates and abundance. That, that's, that's really wild. So you, on, on how many uh, like catalog entries would you say that you, you get on a given year? Like how many photo, photographs are taken uh, of these animals that you have to to sift through on a given year? Thousands, hundreds of thousands of photos. Um, that's a harder number because we also get videos too, mm -hmm. especially nowadays with drones. We get a lot of a lot of that. But on average, it's between two to 5,000 sightings a year that wow. my team has to sift through and put into the catalog. And it takes a lot of time. I think it's, it's you know, just each sighting takes time. Yeah. Um, and because you're, is, is this something that you do as a part of your, your job every day is going through these photos and comparing the, uh, you know, the, just the images, the, the flukes and the, and, and the Colossus, you know, how you're going and looking at each of those individually and comparing them to like, how do you, how do you start that? Do you have a software that kind of gives you a, a starting place or do you have to from memorization? Oh, this one's this animal, right. Or, or I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah. So yeah, we have this software that that um, was made in the 80s or 90s, um, but that kind of houses all of our data. And so it has different levels to it. We have areas that we can enter the data, but then there's areas that have like, it's kind of like the online catalog. Each whale will have their own page and you can see photos of it. The online catalog is a kind of a pared down version because as I mentioned, there's at this point, there's millions of photos in our catalog. So the internet version's pared down where we just pick kind of the best photos of each whale. Um, yeah. But on our end of things, we can see every single photo is ever taken of that whale. And the really cool thing is, so some of these whales have thousands of images of just them. And so we can sometimes match these whales by one flipper or like a scar on its back or a piece of it, like a corner of its tail. Like we don't even need oftentimes the whole like body to be able to match who the whale is. And yeah. so I think that's at least that's one of my favorite parts of the job is the matching. It's, I, it's kind of a game and it's fun. And then you also like get to learn the whales along the way, which then when you're on a boat, seeing them in real life, you're like, yeah. Oh yeah, I just, that's so-and-so I just smashed that whale yesterday. <laughs> That's wild. That is that is absolutely wild. And so all of this data that you're collecting, these photo IDs, um, they feed into models. Am I correct here to to figure out the 
the pop, pop the the population estimate of these animals how many right whales are left in our ocean correct um and and i'm going to pull up a chart here that you sent um and this is also available online as well uh that shows the it, it's a sen essentially the report card or, or the current population trend correct amy um i'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about this this figure that we're looking at here yeah. So, I mean, in general, it's it's hard to get an exact number because, you know, these whales live in a very large ocean. And while we have a lot of sightings and survey efforts, you're still not going to see every single whale, whale every year. So there are definitely some calculations involved that are over over my knowledge base, um, people who are really good at those kind of things. But yeah, they take into effect the sightings that came in, how many individuals were identified in a given year. And there's other some corrections for, you know, the whales that we maybe didn't see that year for the whales that may have died. And a big thing, too, is that, yeah, maybe one year we only saw two whales that had died. But that doesn't mean others didn't die somewhere else that were never seen. They may have sunk to the bottom or ended up on some really remote beach somewhere. Um, and so we have calculations to factor that in to get a, as accurate as the numbers we can. And so this chart shows that estimate over the years. Um, dating back to, I think it's 1990. Um, and as you can see, the population actually was increasing. Um, it was actually doing pretty well. Back in the early 2000s, people were pretty optimistic how quickly right whales were bouncing back. Um, but then about uh, around 2010 is when the decline went in the opposite direction, which is, which is not what we want to see. Um, and so you, as you can see now, we've gone back down to 336. So we're backtracking quite a bit. And that's the big concern is that it's going down pretty quickly. It's not just a gradual. And we, of course, want this population to go back up. <laughs> yeah. And and so looking at that, I, I will say I, my brain is churning with questions. If you are watching this and have any questions, leave them in the comments. We'll have time to get to those uh, at the end of this. But um, something a statistic that that stuck out to me when I was looking at that report card um, was that each in a given year, it seems like you you all are able to to document between 85 and 90 percent of the entire population. Like you're actually able to get eyes on that much of the population. I mean, to me, is, is that true? Uh, you know, 85 to 90 percent that that number? Um, I don't know the number specifically, but I believe it. I mean, and again, yeah. it's not just us. It's sightings from all yeah. over the country and Canada. There's so many contributors that add these sightings. Um, you know, the Canadian government has tons of surveys. So it's, it even, it's again, not just surveys, it's yeah. anyone. And so that's what we always like to encourage. Like, if you see it right well, take a photo and report it. We want to know. Yeah. Like, it, it might, it'll, it'll probably end up in the catalog. You know, and that's data. We love to see that because as much as we want to be everywhere at once, we can't be. Yeah. And and so how would you this is actually just a great question here. How how would you uh, tell the public to, that how do you identify right whales compared to other whales out at sea? Um, I'll put up I'll pull up a picture here of one. Um, oh, yeah. So a unique thing about right whales is they don't have a dorsal fin, which is the fin on their back. Uh, like, as you know, like maybe Orcas are a good example. They have that huge fin on their back. Right whales actually have no fin on their back. Um, so that's one um, notable thing. Um, but more specifically, the most unique thing is the callosity patterns on their head. So that those white rough patches on their head. There's no other whale that's going to, other whale species that's going to have that. Um, so that's, that's very obvious. And then from a distance, um, because of the way their blowholes are shaped, their blow comes out as a V-shaped blow or spout and most other species it'll either be bushy or it'll be really tall and skinny but right whales it's like a perfect v shape um sorry i may not have a photo of that for you but it's a very obvious v shape at a distance and so that's like the best telltale because there's no other whale um in new england or really maybe anywhere off the u.s coast that'll have that perfect v shape blow yeah. and then their their tails um, they lift their tails when they dive, but humpback whales do it as well. But humpback whales will sometimes have white pigmentation on the underside of their tail. Right whales' tails are all black on both sides, with the exception of scarring, unfortunately. But mostly all black, very smooth tails. Yeah, I have another picture that we'll get to in a second that shows that very well. Um, but that that is wild that 
um, you know, people are actually seeing like the entire population that there, there are so few of these animals out there that uh, I, I don't know, to me, that's, that's pretty wild to, to wrap your head around. Uh, and, it, and it speaks to the severity of, of what we're facing here. It's, it definitely seems like an uphill battle. Um, but, but Amy, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, so we have 336 of these animals left that we, that we estimate. Um, what, what are some problems that come around with such a low population size of these animals? Um, I'm, I'm curious, like, do they have trouble finding mates? Um, I, I, I've heard, I've heard, uh, that the number of females is, is pretty alarmingly low. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, about those issues that, that come around. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, they're big questions that, you know, there's a lot we don't know answers to, but in general, in the overall population, we see a, a bit more males than females. Um, and then in terms of like reproductive females, they have to be of like the right age. And also they only give birth um, every few years. Actually, something that's interesting is the calving interval. So the time between whales having calves has gotten longer more recently, which is another issue of their um, um, their population, is that it used to be maybe three to five years in between having calves. And now we're seeing the average of 10 to 12 years in between having calves. Um, it's hard to say exactly what that is. It's likely a combination of factors. Um, and so in a given year, it just changed every year, but the number of females that could potentially give birth is usually around 80 or so individuals. Okay. Um, but just because they can doesn't mean they will. And so lately we've had anywhere from zero to about 20 calves has been like the last handful of years. And so that's, you know, just a small percentage of the 80 or so females that could be giving birth. Yeah, and I, I figured I'd pull up this this photo. This one is Giza or Giza uh, and and her calf. Uh, I don't yeah, know so the, the mom is the whale on the left. Her name is Giza, and that is her calf. This was from last summer. So that calf is uh, approaching a year old now, but was about uh, six or seven months old at the time. Yeah, and here's another photo of a, of a mom and calf pair. Uh, this one, uh, you, you sent me this one. This is number 3157. So I assume you don't name them all. That's correct. Yeah. Um, it can be really hard to name whales, especially because we're really trying hard to name them off of markings because the idea from the naming came from making them easy to recognize in the field. And there's some whales that we just really struggle with because they just don't have anything distinctive. I mean, their colossity is distinctive, but it doesn't like, you know, spark a good nickname. And so um, I'd say even less than half of the right whales actually only have nicknames. Uh, but every single way on the catalog gets a catalog number. So as you said, this one is 3157. They all have a four digit number, um, which is an easy way for us to keep track whether or not they have a nickname. Yeah. And so with this data that you're collecting, right, um, it, it helps you gain a, a knowledge of how many of these animals are out there. But what what are other trends that you are looking for? Like are are these animals changing where they spend their time? Is that something that you're also looking for or, or, or you know, that data that you're collecting? Like, I'm, I'm curious, what, uh, what else are you looking for besides like the numbers themselves? I mean, in, there's a lot of things to look for. Obviously, numbers are kind of the main thing that everyone wants to know. Um, my team keeps a lot, looks a lot at health assessment, um, not even just injuries that they face, but just general health, um, especially when we get um, photos that come from a boat, we can get a, we can get a look at maybe how fat they are. Um, the fatter, the better with right whales. We want them to be big, fat and happy. Um, so sometimes we can see if they're maybe a little skinnier, a little unhealthy, not that we can do anything about it, but it just gives us a sense of the overall health of the population. Um, but then another thing is, yeah, where they are and things have been changing in the past 10 or so years. Um, this is, we suspect it's related to climate change. Um, we know the oceans are getting warmer um, and right whales are actually filter feeders. They like to eat plankton and they actually, they have a, one specific type of plankton they like to eat. And that type of plankton um, thrives in colder water. And so as the oceans are warming, that plankton is seemingly shifting north. And so the whales are having to abandon previous locations and explore into new locations. So like the Gulf of St. Lawrence, for example, which is kind of towards the top of that map, um, that wasn't 
to our knowledge, that wasn't a very popular area for them to be feeding in the summertime. Um, but maybe starting at 2010 or a little after that, they started seeing more and more right whales. And now it's thought that two thirds of the population actually feeds there in the summertime. So it's definitely gotten more important to them. And it's seemingly because their, their cold loving food shifted into the colder waters there. Yeah, that's wild. Um, and I think what we're talking about here transitions really well to the next topic we want to we want to cover here, um, which are talking about those modern threats to these animals. Like what what is driving that population decline um, of uh, of this very small population as is? Um, I would you know we can and that that is, it seems like something that you do uh, you are able to document in those photos that that you receive and and that you document in your catalog. Um, so I'm curious, I do have some photos that I will share uh, that that show some of these, but um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, those modern threats. Yeah, so the, at least the human caused threats right now, the biggest ones are um, vessel strikes and entanglements and fishing gear. Those are the two main things that um, these whales are facing. Obviously climate change is something, but more directly, um, like that photo, for example, is a very young calf that got hit by a boat off the coast of off the coast of Florida. Um, and something like people, you know, a lot of people imagine that these are huge ships that are killing these whales. And that's not the case. Um, they actually this particular one, they actually know it was just a sport fishing boat. I think it was only 50 feet long. Um, of course, it was an accident. These always are. But it just goes to show people that any boat can kill a whale. Um, and that particular incident, um, as I said, a sport fishing boat, we believe the mom got hit as well. And while we think, well, she survived immediately, uh, she has not been seen since that happened. So this is Infinity's calf. Um, and so sometimes, you know, they're lethal. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they can last a little bit longer. Then entanglements are another thing. Uh, so the white around this whale's tailstock, that's all entanglement scars. It at some point in its life had some sort of rope wrapped around its tail um, because it doesn't have rope anymore. It's It survived that. Um, but entanglements is a serious risk. Actually, 86% of right whales have been entangled at least once in their life. Over 50% have been entangled twice. And some whales have been entangled, have been entangled as many as nine times in their life. Um, so it's definitely a huge problem. The entanglements aren't always as lethal, but there's any number of issues that could be causing them down the road, never mind the stress of the event itself. Um, but all the energy they need to use to heal from that event, and maybe who knows if they got infections from those entanglements. Um, entanglements cause a really wide range of issues for right whales. But those are the two main uh, human cause threats that right whales are facing. And especially we can kind of see that the when the population was going up for a while until about 2010, um, that was kind of when we started seeing whales shifting to different areas. And in these new areas, they didn't have some of the same closures that they had in previous areas. So right whales are going into basically unprotected waters, if you will. Um, areas off the US have had closures in place or speed restrictions and things like that. But when the whales enter into new areas, they run into a whole bunch of problems because they were never there before. So people didn't know how to prevent these things from happening. And so it was about the time that they started moving to new areas that the decline started happening. So that's how we think it. things are all kind of connected in that way. Yeah, it's it's wild how all these topics are so connected. And that leads into a good uh, transition for the conversation a little bit. I know, Ashley, um, you you, uh, you know, talking about like vertical lines in the water. That's a that's a, a big thing. Um, I'm, and, and Ashley, I know you're, you, you keep uh, a close eye on what's happening in Massachusetts with, with lobster fishing. You, you know, you, you recreationally do it as well every now and then. And, um, I'm curious, like, you know, what, what are some of those solu solutions that are being explored that, you know, uh, you know, that, that Anderson Cabot might work with or, or that your data helps to, to drive these, you know, uh, changes. Um, sorry, that for me or for Ashley? Oh, yeah. Yeah. For all, I figured Ashley might be able to talk a little bit about it as well. Um, I know yeah. you're, you, you, you keep very close attention to, to this stuff. Yeah. So 
being in the marine mammal industry, um, of course, you have to have, regardless of who you are and what animal specifically you're looking at, um, you need to have specific permits through the federal government, um, NOAA fishery specifically, to do a lot of this work. Um, so with that comes, like any job and permitting process, a lot of meetings. Um, so some of those meetings lately are just this topic, um, right whales, other whales inclusive as well, but of course the right whale comes you know, left, right, and center because of the, the status of the population. Um, so there's been a lot of work in recent years with both, you know, industry professionals, you know, that make a lot of these traps and fishing gear, um, but also with the fishers themselves to start looking at ways that we might be able to limit or in a perfect world, eliminate the number of vertical lines that are in the water that these animals are getting tangled up in. Um, so, you know, you can picture an animal swimming through the water column they don't necessarily know when they're going to run into these things. Um, and if they're in an area where they're feeding, their mouth is open. So if they go through that line and then they close their mouth, that line is getting stuck in their baleen. And then their, you know, their immediate reaction is to try to get that out and they'll often roll. Um, and then that line will get wrapped around their body as well. Um, so there is, Amy can probably speak to the calf out there right now um, with a mom that is critically entangled. Um, you know, so it, it it's those moments that really drive home this point of, you know, there has to be a better way to coexist and to come up with solutions that can help these animals, but still allow the fishermen to, you know, continue their livelihood and, you know, bring the money home to then feed their own family. Um, so there's, there's a lot of coexistence that has to happen there and, you know, some trials and tribulations that we have to go through to see what we can do to help this population. Hopefully we'll start seeing that graph, hopefully going up instead of continuously going on a downward trend. Yeah. And, and Amy, do you have any other thoughts on, on that as well? Well, it just, it, the, um, in some ways it's kind of ironic because, um, part of the decline could potentially be just, um, technology is getting better, boats are getting bigger and faster, rope is getting stronger. And so all of these things are negatively affecting, indirectly, but negatively affecting right whales. Um, but so as technology gets better, one of the really interesting things that's coming out of it is to try and make the fishing gear safer. And again, like as Ashley said, eliminating the rope in the water might sound crazy, but the technology is coming out where they are called, they're making what we call ropeless fishing gear. And so they're finding ways to take that rope out of the water column, but still allow the fishermen to continue fishing. And again, like the coexisting is, is exactly it. That's the best case scenario. Fishing is still happening, but the rope is no longer there. Um, so it's definitely something that's still very much in progress, but it's, it's out there, it's being tested. Um, we just need to get it widespread. I mean, it's going to take some time, but it just, just uh, technology is, you know, coming back in the positive this way. Yeah. And that sounds like, uh, you know, a big question that, that I know a ton of people out there are probably wondering is like, how can I actually help these animals? How do I play a role? And I mean, if you're young, if you're a young student or, or someone at university, you know, these, these technology, technological innovations, this, this could be you coming up with some of these solutions, right? I mean, this is, this has happened over you know, the path in very recent history. I mean, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong there. Yeah, it sounds like I'm right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's happening so quickly. And that's one way people can get involved. Um, Amy, I'm curious, if are there any other ways that people can educate themselves a little bit more about these animals or, or get engaged with the work that you're doing? Other than if you see a, a right whale taking, you know, uh, submitting those photos, how else can people uh, who are listening, you know, share this with their families or, 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 or get, get engaged with you a little bit more? Well, I, my favorite thing to tell people is just spread the word. There's a lot of people that a don't know if right whales exist. They don't know these whales that are right in their backyards. They, they come through the Gulf of Maine. They're off the coast of Massachusetts for most of the year. They're here. And a lot of people, just because they don't see them, they don't know about them. So just spreading the word, but then not only that they're here, but they're in trouble and very direly in trouble. This isn't like a tomorrow problem. This is a today problem. It's really a yesterday problem. Um, yeah. 
but so just spreading the word is something. And then um, if it's like calling your local representatives to tell them how much you care about white whales and because there are different acts that are trying to be passed to protect them, um, those things can definitely help. Um, you can, my team actually has a sponsorship program. You can adopt a whale and that um, directly helps maintain our catalog and our field work and things like that and research. Um, but yeah, submitting sightings is a big thing. I will, I like to point out that there is a 500 yard rule where you're not supposed, you cannot be within 500 yards of a right whale. So as much as we want your photos and your sightings, please just maintain a very safe distance when you do that. Um, the safest way to go look at a right whale is to go to Cape Cod right now because you can actually see them from the beach and you can be, doesn't, your, your distance doesn't matter if you're standing on land. <laughs> Um, yeah, that, those are great points. And I, I did add here on the bottom of the screen the uh, hotline to keep in, in your phone if you ever do see one of these animals. Um, so that that's your reporting hotline on there, correct, from Florida to North Carolina, I see. And Maine, and we have Virginia to Maine. Um, so those are those two regions. Um, and we have also this this one right here. And, and for any of you watching, we will put all these links that we've been featuring through the, the webinar in the comments. Uh, after the webinar. So you'll be able to access those uh, and save those as well. Um, but yeah, that's that's a common thread, keeping your distance if you're a voter and being res a respectful voter um, from what it sounds like. Um, are, do you have any resources on your website, Amy, uh, about you know how to safely and, and respectfully boat, uh, you know, what, when right whales are around here? How do you know when right whales are around here? Uh, you guys gotta keep your eyes out. <laughs> <laughs> um, that some another uh, a cool resource that I think Brian will share is the uh, it's called Whale Map, um, and it's actually a website that shows all recent sightings. Um, like survey teams will put out their sightings, opportunistic sightings will go out there, and so it's just kind of cool to actually see where the right whales are. And it's not real time; it's usually like by the end of the day they, they get posted the next day. Um, but it can kind of give you an idea, you know, if you're going to go on the boat tomorrow you can see on whale map like oh there's a lot of right whales where i'm going or oh there's none just because there's none doesn't mean there's not any there just means they weren't reported um yeah. i mean i just like to say in general right whale or not there's plenty of animals out there that could get hit by your boat no matter how big or small your boat is and so the most important thing is just to be really aware when you're on the water you should be keeping a lookout if you're driving have a have a lookout just always be looking because you never know when something's going to pop up in front of you that's a great point. And what, um, before we get into questions from the audience, which we do have quite a few, um, I do want to share just a, a few video clips of these animals that that you did share with us. Um, so people, so our, our, our audience can actually see what these animals do look like. Um, it's an, an opportunity that very few people do get to see these. Um, so I want to play those videos. And, and Amy, I am curious, you know, what we, we have covered, it's a very heavy topic um, talking about North Atlantic right whales. They, they are a very endangered large whale species, but what, you know, what gives you hope for these animals? You know, it, it, what every day when you're working, you know, what gives you hope that these animals are going to make uh, a turnaround and, and, and come back to pre 2010 level and, and, and get back onto that track that they, they once were on. I mean, I think the biggest thing is that we, we've, we've been able to show that these whales really are resilient. Um, we've seen them get really terrible entanglements and then go on to live a healthy life after. Um, and so like they're resilient, they're, they're survivors, they're tough. Um, we just need to stop killing them is really what it comes down to. Um, we know that the population was down um, Around like the 1930s, we think the population was really low, like maybe between between 10 and 20 individuals. And now we have 336. While that's still not a large number, it's a lot more than 20. So they have come back from worse. And in fact, in 2010, the population was closer to 500 and they were steadily increasing. So they can it can definitely happen if we just stop killing them or minimize the human effects that we're having on them. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Um, it, it's we we know what's happening to these animals. It's it's one of those cases where we know what's going on. Um, will we be able to come up with solutions? You know, like you said, we needed these we needed these yesterday, right? So um, there's there's definitely an urgency to make it happen. Um, and and you know, seeing these seeing these videos, I mean, it definitely 
these are incredible animals that you know they they call their home uh, you know new england new england is their home um and and they are one of those species right in our backyards that that you know we we are you know a, a bunch of organizations and individuals are are working to to make that change happen so um we're going to dive into yeah sorry to get all all emotional there for a second but um uh we're going to dive into uh some questions that i see from the audience ashley do you want to do you want to kick those off sure um, so we'll start with one that was received earlier today um, through our Instagram account. Have right whales made any adaptations in order to preserve their species? I mean, just the fact that they've seemingly been able to shift their habitats by their food moving, I think is a good example that they are flexible and willing to move, even if it's like a place they've never been to before. They're like, hey, I need food. I'm going to go to this area, even though I've never been there before. So they're definitely flexible. And again, they're resilient. Um, they've been finding ways to survive their injuries and go on to thrive, have calves. I mean, we touched on it before, but the the mom that's entangled right now, like she is tangled up in fishing gear and she managed to give birth to a calf and the calf seems to be healthy. So they're resilient and I like to think that they can adapt when they need to. Great. All right. Let's see. Um, Megan O asked, I know that you can identify the moms of the calves, but how are you able to say who the fathers are unless you have seen them mate? It's a great question. Um, so part of our research, uh, we actually take genetic samples from whales and specifically we focus on getting genetic samples from each calf that's born. And so we actually have, I'm not sure of the exact number, but it's somewhere between 80 to 90% of the population we have genetically sampled. Um, so once the, we get these, um, they're just like very small skin samples, we send them to a lab and they're able to look at the DNA and genetics. And if we have a sample from the father, then we can match it and know who the father is. Um, so the mother is easy, obviously, but the only way we would know the father is from genetics because we believe that these whales are mating with multiple individuals. So even if we saw it happen, we wouldn't know if that would be the moment that that calf was conceived. It could be any number of whales it mated with that season. And this kind of ties into that. Um, but Megan H. asked, is there a way to identify the whale's gender from a distance? Um, so on their underside, if they roll over, you can, um, the, they, the males just have one really long slit and then the females have three smaller slits. Um, so if we, if they roll over and we can see their belly, we can fairly easily tell if it's a male or female. Great. All right. Let's see. How about we'll go to Lisa. Um, she was wondering, um, Megan was also wondering this. And I can speak a little bit to it, um, but just asking if there are subsidies out there. So we've we talked a little bit and hit a little bit about the concept of ropeless fishing, um, but especially with a lot of this technology, you know, we're talking about pop up receivers and you know GPS and having to float these traps to the surface. So none of that is going to come cheap, especially in the initial phase when there aren't a lot of products being put out there into the market. Um, so they were curious if there are subsidy programs out there similar to a farm subsidy um, for these fishers that are going to have to eventually adapt their gear to fit these new, whatever it may be, whatever, you know, the winning, the winning things are that, you know, come out to be, you know, the top producers um, and the most valuable to the population. Um, but I can speak a little bit to that in that, a lot of these meetings that we've been on, that's been a, a big question from these fishermen is, you know, this is going to cost me a ton of money. How am I going to be able to do that and still go on fishing? Um, and there are some subsidies, um, the federal government as well is looking at that. I can't speak to the exact numbers because it's none of that is final yet because this is all still in the testing phase. Um, so, you know, fishermen can't right now just go out and buy this gear. Um, they're working with the producers themselves that are engineering these products to test them first. 
Um, so we don't know exactly what it's going to cost yet, but they are looking at some subsidy programs to be able to help these fishermen to then outfit their vessels with the gear that they are going to need. Yeah, I would say, Ashley, you said it well. It's it's We hope it to be there and I, we hope it to be more prevalent in the future because it's definitely, it's going to be costly. Um, like we do know that once the technology gets more widespread, the the it'll get less expensive, but crossing that hurdle is going to take a lot of commitment and a lot of money that the average officer may just not have to switch their gear over. So yeah, we would love to see a lot of subsidies, government subsidies, even fun, like a way for people to just make funds. Like that's, that's what we need to see happen. And I think there are some, but we need more. Yeah. Yeah. Good points. Um, Catherine asks, do I understand correctly that right whales are a very local animal and not worldwide? So there are technically three species of right whale. North Atlantic right whale is one species and you're correct in that North Atlantic right whales only live locally here. So basically off the coast of the U.S. and Canada. There are two other species, the southern right whale, which is off Argentina in the southern ocean. And then the North Pacific right whale, which, if you can believe it, are even more in dire um, situation than the North Atlantic right whales. Um, more so in that they have no idea how many are left because they're just they are not as in local area or um, well covered areas. So they just aren't seen very often. Uh, but so those are three different species. There's no overlap um, in their area at all. So North Atlantic right whales are, yes, only locally here in the North Atlantic. Great. Ooh, I like this question that just came in. Um, also from a Catherine. <laughs> um, fun question for you. Any specific individual that's your favorite? One that's particularly charismatic or a special story? Oh, it's hard to pick just one. I feel like I just keep getting more and more favorites over the years. I think Boomerang has always been one of my favorites. There's uh, some catalog pictures of her earlier. Um, she, I've seen her with her calves and she just, from my distant perspective, seems like a good mom. And she's always like looking really healthy. She's always really fat, which is again, good thing for a right whale. Um, and I think she was one of the early ones I learned how to identify um because i think her velocity was pretty unique to me uh, so she's just one of the one of my favorites actually 3157 is another one of my favorites um i remember there was one time i was doing an aerial survey and she was down off the southeast and anytime we have a female off the southeast we're like oh she's gonna have a baby she's gonna have a baby and we saw her one day she was by herself and she was all wiggly and just acting really funny like not what you see a, just a right well by itself doing and we were like oh my gosh is she having the baby and we circled and circled in the plane and nothing happened and then uh, I think it was within like five days she was seen with a very small calf um, so we like to think that maybe she was starting the labor process um, so I guess those are just two of my favorites there's too many to mention I guess Sundog is another favorite that was one of the videos that was shared a little while ago I love them all it's hard not to. <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a really good question. Um, and yeah, I, I'd imagine. Do you do you get like attached to these animals, like working with them every day? I mean, I know a lot of times in in rehab in the world of animal rehab, um, you know, with seals, uh, some people avoid naming them because they don't want to get attached to them. But um, in this case, I think it's a pretty powerful tool. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong there. Yeah, and especially given like that our, you know, having the catalog numbers just doesn't have the same ring to it. And so in some ways, like the naming started as a like a helpful tool for us in the field, but it's like turned into like just a really good way to people for people to connect with the whales. And like, you know, just talking about 3157 isn't the same as talking about boomerang or, you know, other named whales. So it definitely it gives I think it gives those named whales a little bit of an advantage. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you definitely, it's hard to not like, yeah, form what you think are connections. Obviously it's a very one-sided connection. Um, yeah. But, and again, for me, at least they just grow like the more whales I see or just whales I tend to recognize better than others. Um, you, you, you kind of feel like they're your whale. Obviously they're not. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, that's true. Um, Ashley, do you want to go with maybe one more question before we wrap things up here? Sure. Um, how about this one from Megan O? Um, we've seen a two-year increase in births from lows of zero to three a year. Why the sudden increase? And do you think it will continue? Um, and I believe last I heard we're at 15 calves spotted this year. Yep. So far, there's been 15 calves born, um, which is a good number, but we'd love to see something more in the 20 to 30 range. Um, to be completely honest, I don't think anyone really knows why there's an increase, but we're really not going to complain about it. Um, hopefully that just means maybe this shift in habitat has helped them find better food. Um, but yeah, I mean, the thing to note is that, yeah, the past two years we've had uh, a good number of births. Again, we want to see closer to like 25 or 30 for us to really see some change. Um, but the population was still going down and that's because there's a, a bit of a delay when it comes to births versus our catalog number um, because just because a whale is born it's not immediately added to the catalog we give it time to grow up so we can recognize it and to make sure it survives too because in nature in, in general we know that not every offspring survives to adulthood um, so there's a lot of very a lot of variety to it and again um, you know, we're getting 5,000 sightings a year, so it takes us time to get those sightings in. Uh, so we're usually a couple years behind. So I, I, at least me personally, I'm hoping that with these few years of um, higher birth counts that we're going to see the population turn back in the positive again. But we'll see. Yeah, I think I think that's a really solid note to uh, kind of wrap things up here on. Um, you know, talking about that outlook, what, where we're at right now. Um, but, but Amy, thank you so much for, for taking the time. Thank you for also being a, a Marine Mammal Rescue volunteer and being a part of our team. Um, you know, it's, it's a pleasure to hear your expertise on these animals um, and, and to, to, to give our audience just this, uh, a better idea of, and a better knowledge of what's happening with these animals in, in 2022, 2021. Um, you know, where, where we're looking at in the future. So thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah. Happy to be here. Always, again, always happy to spread the word. There's, there's so much to like the things that me and my team work on and right wells in general. So I encourage people who are interested by this to check out some of the resources um, that Brian and Ashley will share. Cause there's, there's a lot to learn. <laughs> there's yes, a lot absolutely. that we can't cover in an hour. <laughs> Absolutely. And I will share all of those in the comments. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, uh, we will put those up in the comments once we complete this uh, this video. So bear, bear with us. Give us some time. But um, but yeah, really great stuff. I, I know I learned a lot. Um, Ashley, is there anything you want to say uh, before we sign off here? I don't think so. I just want to thank everybody you know, for taking time out of your evening. I know it's tough to, especially in the world we're in now, to sit on another thing virtual. Um, but it's a it's a safe way right now that we can bring you some of this really exciting research that's going on um, and share knowledge with you. You know, it's one thing we're passionate about this. So, you know, we're in this day to day. Um, but sometimes, you know, the public doesn't get to hear as much about it. So, you know, any way that we can share knowledge with you guys, you know, we're really excited to do it. So thanks for spending the evening with us. Yeah. Knowledge is power. Um, so good stuff. Uh, thank you all again. Thank you, Amy. Um, yeah, we look forward to uh, hopefully seeing you, seeing you uh, around with our, our rescue team soon. So we'll uh, we'll we'll see you, and and hopefully uh, we see some more good news coming from uh, the right the right whale world. So uh, yeah, we'll sign off there. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you, Amy. Um, yeah, good stuff. Thanks, everyone.